three, oh. two, oops. Okay, we can wait, to be honest. Yeah. No, no, no. It started saying this meeting is being recorded. I've never heard that before. <laughs> All right. Whereas they're saying, you can't not do this. This is they're, they're basically what my parents were saying, which is what Asian parents are saying is, this is the guaranteed way to a successful career. Yeah. And if you go away from that, you're causing yourself problems. And they're right, of course. I was at, you know, you know and I was 32. Uh, and I said to her, look, I don't know how this is going to happen, but by the end of this World Cup, I'm going to have a job. And I, and, and that's, I suppose, one thing that I've been very good at is just being like, I'm going to create so much work of such a high quality that everyone is going to be turning around the whole time going, what, how does he even do this? Nicholas looked at my face and he went, oh my God, you're the same. And I said, we're writers, Mark. Like we don't write for a job. It's, we've managed to make writing into a job. So I think that Pakistan really opened up my eyes to cricket and probably is the reason that I ended up becoming a global cricket writer rather than an Australian cricket writer. It all comes back to Pakistan. So, Hello and good morning, Jared. How are you? It's good afternoon, but I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> and we are live so yep um hello everyone uh today i've got someone pretty special uh in the name I'll, I'll i'll try to probably limit it down to limit him down to cricket journalism and i'll start i'll start with the, the typical introduction of like counting on the achievements of your guests and just to list a few i think they're quite varied um as his insta bio says i make videos on cricket and i've also done pretty much every other job on cricket so he's a freelance writer for the cricket info and wisdom he has his own youtube channel he's recently started his own podcast he does video essays on cricket it's written for the independent the telegraph written three books and he's also co-directed a movie called death of a gentleman uh also started a course for uh some of the young journalists in sports called fans with laptops and it's just not all about talk i think uh one of, one of the another monumental achievements of jared i would say is uh working as a data analyst for two of the world's top T20 franchises, St. Lucia stars for the Caribbean Premier League and the Melbourne uh, stars for the Big Bash. And so, yeah, hello and good morning, Jared. How are you? It's good afternoon, but I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 that's true. Uh, so, so basically, let's, let's jump straight to the point. Um, mm -hmm. I mean... It's it sounds quite comical. I make videos on cricket. I've also done pretty much every other job in cricket. Your Insta bio, but how does it come to you? Is is has it been like a natural process for you trying out pretty much everything to do with outside the cricket field, or how do you go about it? Uh, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> I mean, I don't think anything in my career has been a natural process. It's just a lot of things in my career have happened. Um, sorry, I've got man out on my roof at the moment i did not expect that to happen uh on the second floor of uh, my office but um uh yeah i um I, I don't think anything was sort of natural it's just that i get bored uh it's probably the easiest way of putting it and so uh i follow what i'm interested in at that time and that has taken me in a lot of random directions yeah yeah makes sense makes sense and and i'll i'll uh take you back a little as per my Bit of a research I did in you. I mean, what it says is you grew up in Melbourne and studied in a school called Epping Secondary College, graduated in 1997. But, so take me back to the oh, early years oh, oh, oh. before I we... did not graduate. I was asked to leave the school. I did not graduate. Oh, Let's right, not right, besmirch right, right. Epping Secondary College or me. <laughs> 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 so yeah i mean that's where i mean that's an interesting point then like let's go back to those years what were the first what were your earliest memories and then about your school like i mean i would love to hear the story uh my, my school was quite a random school it was um uh, the area i was from was very working class when i grew up and was probably becoming more middle class at that point and the school was kind of doing a similar thing so the first day or within the first week of us going there i remember a kid being expelled for trying to stab another kid uh <laughs> it was you know quite a rough area um and then by you know i remember i went back a couple of years ago uh to the school and they had a debate club 
uh, things had, I mean, you know, we had different kind of debating clubs back when I was there, I would probably suggest. Uh, so it had changed quite a bit. It was, it was quite a rough uh, out of suburbs school um, in Melbourne. Um, a lot of very, very different ethnicities uh, went there. It was very, it was a very multicultural area uh, where I grew up. And uh, yeah, it was, uh, it just wasn't the proper schooling environment for me. And whether there was a proper schooling environment for me, I don't know. Uh, but it certainly wasn't, uh, Ep well, it was Epping High School when I started, I think, and it turned into Epping Secondary College. So you could see the gentrification of even the name. Yeah, yeah. So, that's, so what, what was the point where you said, like, you didn't graduate, you were asked to leave? Would you mm -hmm. like to share on that? Oh, there was, I think I was asked to leave school twice. Um, look, I didn't do any work and I was a distraction for every other student. I think those things are very fair. Um, I don't, I think my teachers probably gave me more rope uh, than most people because they thought that, I think there are other kids where they thought there was no way they were going to be able to teach them. And I think in my case, it wasn't that they didn't think they would be able to teach me. It's just that I didn't want to be taught uh, yeah. by them. Um, I would just it, look it's it, funnily enough when I went to primary school uh, at my primary school I quite often the teachers would just take me to a side and give me a bunch of work and let me do it yeah and when I got to high school that wasn't the case everyone had to learn in a group and the problem with me is there's a, I only have two modes I either learn something incredibly quickly and then I don't need the next hour being told the same thing or I don't learn it at all and I have no interest in it and I'm going to be a pain in the ass. So basically that meant that for the second, what were our lessons, 48 minutes long. So for, it took me about four minutes to work out whether I was either going to learn this thing or not. Um, and if I did learn it, well, then I already learned it and I didn't need the next 44 minutes. So that meant I was going to annoy everyone or I didn't learn it and that annoyed me more. So I annoyed everyone else. And I think that, you know, school pushed, as far as uh, they could, uh, I think that there's a, there's a lot of very, very poor teachers at our school, but there's a, you know, a handful of incredible teachers as well. And they kept saying, this is ridiculous. Like, remember my maths teacher taking me aside and saying, you, you put yourself down for basic maths next year and you're already at, above the advanced maths level. Like you could easily do that. And I said, look, it doesn't matter what I put my name down for because I'm not going to turn up to any of the classes anyway. Um, yeah. And so, uh, but, you know, realistically, I, I, when I went to school in Australia, there was this huge movement that basically if you didn't finish high school, you'd be able to get a job again in your life. Uh, everyone had to finish high school and then everyone had to go on to advanced um, education. Um, and now that, you know, a lot of my friends have, you know, incredible degrees while they're, um, you know, making coffees for people and being wedding photographers. So I think that, uh, you know, when it comes down to it, that uh, I had to leave and I probably should have left a couple of years earlier for the betterment of me and the school. Um, but everyone persisted with it because uh, I, I think they just couldn't work out why I, I, you know, I wasn't making it work. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So, so, I mean, was the thought process clear in your head that, okay, you know what, I, as you said, you were clear in your head, either you're going to learn it four minutes or you're just going to walk out or be a distraction or whatever. And that is fair enough to be a bit of a rowdy kid, but were you clear in your head? Like, if not school, then what then? Like, I mean, what if they asked me to leave? Like, did that scare you, the thought? Uh, yeah. I mean, th this is the problem with saying to kids, if you... <laughs> If you don't pass high school and your life's over, you start to believe it. Yeah. So I just thought, well, that's it. Then I'm going to have a shit life and uh, I'm going to, I don't know, maybe work in factories or do manual labor. And I wasn't particularly good with my hands and, or working in factories. So it's not like I was even good at those jobs. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a terrible thing to do. I mean, it's only as I got older, like when I was 25 or 26, I enrolled in film school and like, they just let me in, right? They didn't care that I hadn't finished high school. Like uh, I got jobs over the years when I was, you know, I remember the first major job interview I went to at about 20 or 21. And like, I was terrified. They were just going to ask how I did in high school. And it's like, no one cared. Once you got past the age of 20, especially, no one cared what you did in high school. Like no one looks it up. No one says, please provide a certificate to, uh, telling us your high school grades because they don't really mean anything, right? And then for most universities, mature age students, people who want to come back and study in their 20s are really good because they usually, people 
if you're trying to study at 18, you've already been studying for what, 10, 13 years by that point. Um, and you know, you might be a bit jaded with school life. Someone who's coming back to study at 25 or 35 or 45, quite often uh, they bring skills that other students don't have. So universities were like bending over backwards. So you suddenly realize that the whole thing was nonsense anyway. The best thing I probably could have done at 15 would have been to go off and get a job. And i um, sorry if you can now hear the, my window cleaner here. Um, uh, <laughs> Uh, the best thing I could have done at 15 probably would have been uh, to go off and uh, maybe probably in my case, probably would have been to start some businesses. I had some small business ideas and things at that time, but you're so worried. So you stay on and it ends up just being, I, I got the worst of both worlds realistically in that I didn't get a proper education because I didn't put the time in. And in their particular case, I ruined probably many other students from being able to learn um, as well. So it was, uh, it was a, it was a very poor environment, I think, for everyone involved. But that's what happens when you have a one size fits all education system and you think that everyone is going to come out of it the same. And that's not, you know, that's that's not how things went for me back then. And I don't think it's how it goes for most students, but that's why we try and push everyone into the same kind of learning. And it's not people learn it. One thing I've learned after, you know, years and years of being a journalist and, and also being an analyst is people learn in vastly different ways and if you think everyone's going to learn the exact same way uh you're setting everyone up to fail to begin with yeah 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 no, that, that, that is a remarkable point and 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 just not to like dwell on it of course you've got a lot on cricket to talk about but it's just that I'm trying to understand the process so like what was your age when you were asked to say like okay you, you're not like doing school anymore and yeah i mean we've discussed how you felt but like, what was uh, your age then I was, I think the first time they asked me to leave, I was 16. And then yeah. I came to an agreement uh, with the teachers to come back uh, probably when I was, probably still when I was 16. And then uh, when I was 17, you know, I had a pretty frank discussion with the, the uh, one of the head teachers there and just was like, well, <laughs> well nothing's going to change. Th there was a certain point where the whole thing was toxic, that the teachers were talk. I had turned the teachers toxic. Uh, in, in some cases that the teachers themselves were not ready to do their jobs. And I made it a lot harder as well. And so realistically, as I said, by the time I got to 15, you could have even argued 14, looking back on it, the best thing would have been for everyone to go the next, there's no point Jared being in the school at this point. It is much better off for him to go off and try some other things. And then if he needs to come back to schooling. So, so I was, I was such an advanced student at such a young age that yeah. it wouldn't have really, it wouldn't have mattered if I missed year nine and year, year 10. <laughs> like, and they were the years I really struggled um, just because it wouldn't have mattered. It just, it, there was nothing that I was learning there that I could, I couldn't have picked up in a couple of hours um, coming back. And, and that's, uh, that was the, the, that was the basic problem uh, that we had. So yeah, by 17, I think I, uh, that was when I finally left. Pretty sure that's right. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that is interesting. And, and um, so like, I mean, growing up in, in a South Asian household, there's this typical expectation for me, someone like coming from a background that, you know what, you, you need to do like, you need to do this, like, properly study like the, a degree in engineering or like science or like be do those fancy business school degrees. Like those are the proper degrees that you one would appear in, like, I mean, or a family would expect your kid to do. And like, that is how your, the society defines you've done well. But in, in the household you were growing up or in the culture you were growing up, did you have a similar expectation as well that you did say you personally struggle, you were torn a, a bit between that, you know, what will I end up doing if I don't have high school? But eventually, of course you did well, but what, what was the kind of culture you grew up and did you feel the burden of expectations on you as well from your family and yeah. the culture around yeah i don't think everyone in all of my friends had the same burden that i had so i think they all you know a lot of them uh you know went on to work in the car industry and, and other things they you know were good with their hands and uh yeah uh, worked a lot of those sorts of jobs now if you leave i think where i was from if you left school early to go and get a job as an apprentice you know, plumber or fitter or, you know, carpenter or whatever it may be. Um, I think there was, that was fine. The problem with my particular family is that they, uh, I come from a family where everyone worked in education. And so my father, like me, was also asked to leave school. Uh, my mother finished 
high school but couldn't afford to go on to university because she came from quite a poor background um but almost everyone else in our family especially on my father's side um had uh, so my my grandfather was an orphan uh, who grew up to be a school principal um and so there was this massive sense of overachieving from where you came from but also everyone actually worked in education so my mom was a my mom was a school librarian uh uh my uncle was like, I don't know, second or third in charge of Victorian education. Uh, my auntie was a psychologist for the Victorian education department. My other uncle was a principal. My other auntie was a vice principal. And so not a vice principal, I, I, sorry, a teacher um, herself. And it was like, uh, my cousins, my older cousins had done really, really well already ahead of me. And my younger cousins were um, uh, clearly doing fine. And so I suppose there is a, there was a, that was what the pressure was. I think my parents thought that they had had a bad life because they didn't go on to university. Yeah, that was where I, so I shouldn't say a bad life. They thought that they were their careers were limited. So, for instance, my mum is not a librarian officially because she doesn't have a piece of paper that says she's a librarian. She, after she retired, um, schools around the district would hire her to come in and sort out their libraries. That's how good she was at the job but she couldn't get paid the extra money because she didn't have the certificate that said librarian. And my father took a very long time for him to ever get anywhere in his job for a similar reason. Uh, and, and I think they both saw that as the reason that their careers hadn't gone in the direction that their skills could have gone, you know? Um, and they felt like it had held them back. So there was a lot of pressure in my house for me to get those pieces of paper so that I would never be held back. Yeah. What was very hard for me to explain to them was that I just didn't feel, I didn't, from, from the age of about, certainly by the age of 17, 18, I knew I was going to be a writer of one form or another. And, you know, I had this big, I remember having this big argument with my mother where she basically said, writing isn't a real job. It's what you do when you have another job. So she, and this is a woman who worked in the library, that sort of shows how sort of now we, we we only sort of understood the jobs in our area if that made sense so you know yeah. if there was a writer that my mum knew he would also be a teacher right um and and so i think there was a real narrow sort of thinking there that our family or my, my parents certainly had which was that you couldn't achieve things without that piece of paper but i knew that I knew there was something else within me as a writer, but also knew there was something else within me as a person that I wasn't, I wasn't going to, it wasn't that I was going to, I knew that I had the ability to make things happen from scratch for myself, that yeah. the way that other people probably did not. And that was quite evident to, to me at a, at a fairly young age. And so it was very hard to have the conversation with them because they're, they're looking at, you know, this, it, it's a different situation than having an Asian um, a parent. And I can say this because you know, I spent my whole life with Asian people and my mother-in-law is Sri Lankan. Um, th that's a very different kind of pressure than what my parents have. But it basically boils down to the same kind of thing. Whereas they're saying, you can't not do this. This is they're, they're basically what my parents were saying, which is what Asian parents are saying is, this is the guaranteed way to a successful career. Yeah. And if you go away from that, you're causing yourself problems. And they're right, of course. I was at, you know, tw at 27 um, and 28, I was parking cars for a living and moving shopping trolleys and, uh, you know, uh, uh, working in call centers. So they're not wrong. It's just that there's no way, there's no way I could be the Jared Kimber that's sitting here in front of you now if I'd followed the path of everyone else. Like I, for me personally, it had to be my own path. And that's what I was talking about with the education and everything before, you know, um, realistically whichever whichever way i went it had to be it had to be something i'm only good at things that i'm interested in basically comes down to right and yeah. so it's very hard for me to focus on things that i just don't give any anything anything about and i think that general education that's what it is isn't it general education is literally you know it, it, you know when i talked about before um you know, skipping years of school, if I had been able to, at the age of 13 or 14, go to university, right, it would have been exactly what I needed, whatever I studied, right, it might have been politics, it might have been history, uh, it might have been film, it might have been sport, whatever it was that interested me at that time, I would have done 10 times better going to a lecture, 
listening to someone, getting a bunch of books out of the library and coming out. And that's how my entire career has been built is those sorts of things. What I'm not particularly good at is that sort of generalist thing. Um, but you can certainly see why my parents, because of the way they thought it had limited their lives, were worried that the same thing would happen um, to me. And you can see why many of the Asian parents that you're talking about, Southeast Asian parents, and I suppose Asian parents in general are, are a bit like that, aren't they? Um, yeah. You know, thinking back to my Vietnamese friends and <laughs> that I grew up with, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, very similar in that. And you can see why parents are doing that. But the parents are, are worried that you that it's all going to fall apart for you. They can't, it's very hard for them to see the, the other side of things, which is uh, how it could all go spectacularly right for you because parents naturally worry. Yeah. 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 Makes, makes sense. Makes sense. And, and so that, that is an, a very interesting point to be honest. I didn't expect you to like, divulge on that, but it's just remarkable to hear that from you. And uh, so, so would you like in a way say somebody who's young watching that who, feels like so so you're saying like yeah it's fair enough there's a system that exists and if you hack that you you have done well but like if you if you're not feeling right about it like be confident in like go, going down your own path and back yourself i i think at at a certain point if you <laughs> i see so many people who are really talented who are still stuck in the same job 10 or 15 years later <laughs> really developed anywhere and it doesn't matter if it's a job or a school you could argue relationships are arguably a similar thing again there is a certain point where you have to go i'll, I'll explain it without explaining school so i had something like 25 30 jobs yeah. between the age of seven or yeah between the age of 17 and 20 21 and i finally got a job with Qantas, so a major airline i was in the call center at the age of 24, maybe, I started doing um, uh, stand-in supervising work uh, with them. And so from any, you know, if you look at a company like Qantas, it's a big company, you've got travel benefits. I was getting paid quite a good money for someone who hadn't passed high school and hadn't gone to university. Uh, I uh, worked in with a lot of fun people, a lot of interesting people, people in travel, you know, generally have traveled a lot in their life. So they're, they're, they're more interesting than, uh, than, than some other offices that you can certainly work in. And I was, I wouldn't say I was on the fast track to a good career at Qantas, but I was certainly going towards a decent career. And my girlfriend was on a similar path and she was about two or three years older than me at the time. And she, I don't think she liked the job any more than I did. Yeah. And, I, and, I, and I said to her, look, this is not for me. I've now tried it. And I, I actually really like there, 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 there were parts of the job that actually did really well. Um, but I knew that if I had to be doing it for another three or five years, it just, it wasn't going to end well for me psychologically. Um, and the thing is that she felt similarly about the job in many ways, but she looked at it from a point of, I have to keep, I have to keep doing this because I've got a good job and I can't give up a good job. Whereas I looked at it from the point of view of, doesn't necessarily matter if I have a good job, if it doesn't feel good to me. Yeah. If I'm not getting out of it, what I need to get out of it. Now she was a very smart girl, a woman, sorry. She's older than me as well. Don't know why I called her. Yeah. Uh, she's a very smart woman. Uh, had, or it was already on the property market. Like her life was a lot more organized than mine was, but she basically hung on to that job until they closed. Out. Right. And yeah. I, I'm, not none of this is having a jibe at her she was very good at her job and, and and very organized but quite clearly there was a certain point where she had a lot of other skills that she could have tried outside of that and she could have moved on and is she going to spend the next 10 or 15 years thinking about that and worrying about that i i don't know but i know i would have yeah right yeah. and so yeah. i saw in, in my father i saw someone who never took a chance because he thought he, because he didn't want to and yet he still got screwed over by the system time and time again and so when i came through i was just like i'd rather be unhappy i'd rather be happy and poor right than yeah. unhappy and have and and have a good bank account and so i have taken a series of risks so i think you you every single person in the world kind of has to weigh up their options on their own 
that's not every i'm not saying every single person should quit their job or quit their schooling or quit their relationship but there's a certain point where you just like will you be happier trying to pursue something else uh, look i mean if you look at it i think i quit Qantas when i was 26 off the top of my head and i didn't get a full-time position with crick info till i was 32 right that's yeah. six years of often uh you know for the first three uh, to god even maybe longer god maybe i quit when i was 25 uh, for the first few years anyway for at least three years i had no money like i could barely pay my rent uh, i had to buy all my food in bulk if yeah. i wanted to get drunk we had to brew our own beer like you know absolutely ridiculous levels of i uh, considering that a couple of years before i was making ridiculous money right yeah. so you have to decide what is going what is going to work for you and what is not going to work for you you have to i think you have to ultimately learn some things about yourself and i think that most people don't want to learn things about themselves they'd rather be told that but for those people out there that do want to learn things about themselves um you have to you have to sit down and go okay i'm i don't know 21 and i've done three years of law but i don't really like law and i don't want to practice law and i don't think law is for me but i'm um, Maybe I can try something else. Maybe there's something else that I like. And uh, and I think that for too many people, that's not an option just because they're too poor and they can't uh, afford to do that. And for too many other people, even if they have some money and have the ability or have the options to be able to do that, they don't do it because it's a scary thing. And I, for me, it's always like, I was, I, you know, when I was making those big, bold decisions, I was always weighing up like, what are what is going to be worse me still being in this job in five years time or me or Lee leaving or me me staying in school um like at one stage i'm talking about the only way i could finish high school was to do an extra year and i was like i haven't even done most of the years that you guys have asked me to do the chances of me sticking around to the end are very very minimal here so what do i need to do now and i think that the the biggest thing in life is that everyone thinks you're supposed to know what you are trying to do with your life but in actual yeah. fact, you, you people know that. And I think what you try and do is you try and follow a bunch of passions as far as you can. And the thing that I've learned from the internet is that there is so much out there that you can actually monetize with things that you are most probably already good at, or you could become very good at. And I think that the internet coming along at the right time was a huge, huge boon uh, for me, but I think for many different people, you know, uh, <laughs> there will probably be people leaving school at 16 to become TikTok influencers, right? And yeah. their parents are going to be like, what are you doing? Um, and it's not going to work for most of them. It doesn't work for most athletes who try and make it either. But along that journey, they find other things and they move and they become maybe, you know, different kinds of people it's that's kind of what i'm trying to say I, I i you know hopefully that helps but it's none of these are easy decisions but i don't think staying in the same position is an easy decision either it's just that people do that because it's the safest option yeah 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 that 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 that, that does make sense and and so coming on from that the transition to cricket when so, so like so uh once again like also tell me the air that you put quantas and also once you did that where like did it ever occur to you also growing up that you know what cricket journalism could be a thing that i can pick up and i can be jared kimber for cricket and for one day or it just happened along the way as you said like i just followed my passions and yeah no definitely never thought i'd be a cricket writer i did think i reckon i probably had a period when crick info first got big uh when that was the only website around where i thought i could be a ball by ball guy but i didn't really think about it as a job to be fair i just thought that wouldn't that be cool to write the ball by ball um commentary uh but i certainly never thought of being a cricket writer no i must have i, I can't remember the exact years but i must have been about 25 when i went to film school 25 or 26 when i went to film school um and uh and that was sort of when I went, I think I went part-time at Qantas first and then eventually um, left there. Um, and no, no, the cricket writing was purely by accident. Uh, I had a friend who was writing a basketball blog, Todd Spear. You can buy his uh, book on Drazen Petrovic if you want to go to Amazon right now. Um, yeah. it, you know, he, um, 
he he knew I had done a lot of blogging. I'd done a lot of writing in my life up to that point, even if I'd never been published. Uh, and I pro- there was probably a lot of errors in my work and it probably wasn't where the level it needed to be. But it was quite clear that I could write, that I had some skills and, you know, I helped Todd a little bit. And then Todd was like, why don't you write a cricket blog? Um, and I was like, all right. And then the cricket blog kind of took off within a couple of months. Um, was probably I don't know if, I don't know if it was the biggest cricket blog ever in the world, but if it wasn't, it was probably in the in the top few um, quite early on, um, and that sort of led to led to that. So no, for me, uh, writing and cricket were always separate. I think I'd only ever written a handful of pieces in my entire life about cricket before I started a cricket blog, um, but you know writing was a passion and cricket were a passion. My dad's a cricket coach and my mum's a librarian. Um, so you can figure that one out on your own, but, uh, I never really, um, I never really, uh, thought, Oh, I want to write about cricket. I mean, uh, it just, I wouldn't have even, if, if, if you'd have said to me, do you want to be a cricket writer? And I would have said, yes, I wouldn't have known what to do next. Where do you go? Do I just apply? Do I just call a newspaper? And like, when my blog got really big before I moved to the UK, I'd literally contacted every newspaper in Australia about cricket magazines, everything saying to these guys, I really want to be a cricket writer. I've got this blog. It seems to be doing really well. Are there any positions? And literally not a single person or only one person even got back to me. Um, and there was nothing like, so there was no, I, you know what I mean? And at that stage I was being offered work in the UK as a cricket writer and couldn't even get a call back in Australia. So when I was younger, uh, I wouldn't have even occurred to me that I would have been able to become a cricket writer as a, you know, a, as something that was possible. And, and I wouldn't have, I would not have known how to follow up if that was the case anyway. Yeah. 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 And, and, and you said like, it seems like it wasn't like, you know what, you just, I'm not happy with the system. I'm just quitting it and I'll see how it goes. You said like, I would rather be like, I mean, poor and happy, but like, it it must have occurred to you that you must have planned that you know what if not this system this is the path I'm going to take once you could contest what like okay maybe like the, the being the big cricket writer that the world knows about wasn't exactly clear in your head but what was your big plan that you know what this is now what I'm going to focus or channel my energy on so I think I quit Qantas at the end of my first year of film school and my first year of film school didn't go brilliantly well for a lot of different reasons, you know, personal reasons, professional reasons. I was broke. Like there's a lot of lot going on in my life. Yeah. Um, but like, I knew that when I sat down and, and did something that there was a lot to it. I think that I realized, I think YouTube was coming through at that stage. Um, and you know, you put something up on YouTube and you, you know, people liked it. I had very good editing skills. I taught myself how to edit um, stuff and I was very good at that. I always knew that I was a writer. Um, even if at film school, they kept telling me I wasn't a writer. It's like, I'm pretty sure I'm a writer. Um, I thought I kind of understood directing and, and how to, uh, my mum had w- uh, been in amateur theater. So I'd watched a lot of directors work with actors before. And I kind of understood that, uh, had a basic sort of under- understanding of camera. So I thought that there was something to do with film that was available to me. And I, uh, I, at the end of that first year of film school, which hilariously I also didn't finish after I had a fight with the film school. Um, uh, I was, I always knew we weren't coming back for a second year. And I, I live with a friend called, um, Johnny, uh, and me and him, we, cause we were both mature students. I was about 25, 26. I think he was a couple of years older than me. Um, and we, we were like, we'll do one year of film school and we'll learn everything we can. And the great thing about our film school, Footscray City College, was that it was um, a very practical film school. There was, you had a couple of lectures and lectures were quite often good, but mostly it was, here's a camera, here's the makeup, go see how you go, right? And it meant that over the course of a year, I probably worked, I'd probably never, I'd never worked on a film that I wasn't involved with, that I wasn't like, hadn't written and directed before. Most things I'd done on my own. And suddenly I was, I must have worked on about 20, 25, 30 films that year. And so at the end of that, we were like, we were pretty sure with YouTube coming through that there was a real opening for very creative people to make things and get noticed quicker was our thought. So I went to film school. I don't know. Have you ever seen the film Saw? 
I haven't actually. I'm uh, sorry. I'm just terrible at watching a lot of movies. I kind of no. spoke, so, so, yeah. yeah. Saw. I think they made about eight eight saws now. But saw originally was uh, it was made by two um, kids from Melbourne, two young guys from Melbourne, and right. that's why I went to film school. And they basically got picked up off a bunch of shorts and uh, and stuff, and ended up in Hollywood. And so me and my friends were like. Well, there's no reason we can't make a bunch of creative stuff and and break into the industry. And Melbourne had a really strong film industry as well. Like there are lots of people who wanted to work on films. Um, you know, they always say everyone in Sydney's a DJ and everyone in Melbourne's a filmmaker. And so there were lots of people, you know, be like someone like you, like, uh, you know, in a normal job, but then on the weekend is like shooting, uh, you know, documentaries or horror films or something. There's a lot of that in Melbourne, which meant there was a lot of people to work with. And we were like, if we can get these things out, and because YouTube had just started, like we were also kind of using YouTube and MySpace. That's how long ago this all was. We're kind of using YouTube and MySpace to build up profiles and stuff. So I had like a character that we were going to do this big long series on, which was uh, W.C. Will, who was like a, a, a music. He was a folk musician who couldn't play music um, and wrote terrible songs, but thought that he was going to save the working class and you know, we had, we had the ability to make all that sort of stuff. And we would, we'd make all these little weird shorts and, um, and they did get attention. The problem was that we weren't the only ones who cottoned onto this. And there was probably the, you know, there was probably about 25, um, film production companies, uh, that, uh, of, of groups of people like us that were springing up every month in Melbourne. Yeah. And so I had, a, I remember having a big chat with my uncle at the when we when we launched the company and he was like you know how long are you gonna you gonna have a go with this and i was just like i don't know and he said but when it fails well like, what do you what are you gonna do next i said i don't know i didn't have a plan b all i knew was that if i kept going i would find the thing that worked for me and at that stage i probably thought it was going to be either writing scripts or writing novels um, and then cricket came along and took me in a completely different direction. But if it wasn't right. cricket, it would have been something else. Um, because I was prepared to work, I was working, you know, especially when we had the film production company and I was running the blog at the same time, uh, you know, I was working between 16 and 18 hour days, um, you know, seven days a week. Yeah. You know, uh, quite you know just regularly that was just what i was doing so i think when you're willing to put in that much effort and you have some basic skills and you also you i was looking back on it and i didn't realize this now but i was quite good at understanding how systems worked so you know being able to see uh you know a system and then make something work is kind of it was just at the beginning of the algorithm days right but i yeah. i didn't, didn't know anything about that but looking back where whatever it was that had worked for me I would have I would have been able to game the algorithm that I needed to game um, and and make a successful career off it. Um, I probably, if nothing, even if I wasn't the biggest cricket blogger ever, I probably made more money off my blog than anyone else did just by working out these systems of how to make money off a blog at that time. And yeah. and if it wasn't cricket, it would have been the next thing and it would have been the next thing. And I would have just kept going um, because I think that was, that was my personality and, and that's i mean i still do that now the only difference is now i occasionally have success in the middle yeah 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 it makes sense it seems like i mean at, at that point of time when you joined the film school the footstar city college you had that you had you had something that you were enjoying you're willing to put the hours in and you thought you know what something's going to work along the way maybe not cricket but i'll find my way here i'm enjoying i'm having a good time yeah i look i remember having a chat with mark nicholas a couple of years ago and he was talking about writing and he said, Oh, I had this chat with Gideon Haig. And he said, he, he never, he never has a day where he doesn't write. Isn't that amazing? And Nicholas looked at my face and he went, Oh my God, you're the same. And I said, we're writers, Mark. Like we don't write for a job. It's we've managed to make writing into a job, but we're writers in that, you know, and, and this is not a slander on Mark. I really like Mark's writing, but Mark writes when the mood hit takes him. Right. And when he's got something to say or, you know, or, or perhaps someone has offered him a contract. Right. Me and Gideon Haig from very young ages were writing every day of our life before anyone knew who we were. And if no one had ever known who me and Gideon Haig were, we would still be writing every day of our life. Me and my wife go on holiday and, uh, you know, we take the kids away and the kids go to bed. 
and you know we're in some cottage somewhere that we've hired and i get the laptop out at nine o'clock and she's like can't you just not do that today and i'm like no this is my relax this is now i get to write whatever i want because i'm on holiday right and and so i knew once once i started the film production company really and so film school film production company and then into cricket with balls the, the first blog i had I kind of knew now that A, I was a good enough writer that other people would notice it. B, that probably, but so that you taking me aside right then and there in, I don't know, 2000. And, so I started the blog in 2007. Even, even just before the blog hit, so maybe middle of 2007, you'd contacted me and said, look, you're going to be a writer and you're going to have to write every day for the next 50 years of your life. I would have been like, where's the contract? Right. That, that, that was a no brainer. Like it, it would never, ever have been a problem for me. My biggest problem now as a professional, as, as my career grows and grows and grows is actually finding time to write when I'm supposed to be doing other things. Like the amount of times I have a bunch of basic things that I need to do. And I sit down and I'll be like, Oh, this would be a good piece. And like start it off. And it's just like, I don't need to write this piece. Like for the last couple of years, I wasn't even working for anyone and I was still doing this stuff. So I think that that what we, you know, when it comes down to it, that that is what I was. And I was more chasing being a writer than I was anything else. The fact that someone was willing to pay me to write about cricket, which I loved was fine. But if I'd started writing about crypto, I would have loved that as well. And I don't give a shit about crypto, right? Like I couldn't yeah. care at all um, and uh, you know, it, it, all sorts of things there, you know, I, I, I just love to write and I love to find out things that I don't know and, and pursue them and put them down. And I think that it, uh, the, the cricket was just a pure accident. I think if you look at over the years, I had a personal blog. Um, I had a politics blog. I had a cricket blog. I had a film blog. I had an Aussie rules football blog, probably missing at least one other. Right. Yeah. 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 Could have let me write about any of them to a certain point. The difference with some of the other topics is, I might have found it hard to write continually about one thing, but my career in cricket has been stuck in cricket because people think I only know about cricket because I write cricket with such a depth that no one else has written about cricket. So I kind of trapped myself in cricket that way. That might not have been the case if I'd written about Aussie rules or uh, films or, you know, other things that I, that, that I knew a lot about. And so, you know, uh, for me, the writing always comes. So even when I'm an analyst, you know, I don't really tell teams this, but it all comes from the writing. Like I, it, like, you know, a team will ask me something. I'll be like, all right, I'm going to go off and do something. So when I worked for Melbourne stars, uh, sorry, St. Lucia stars, I wrote 55,000 words that no one ever saw. All right. Yeah. yeah. Cause I, ne I needed to do oh. that, um, to, to work out everything else that I was doing. So it all comes from the writing, uh, you know, uh, being a good writer, it takes a lot of skill, but there's something within me that makes me need to write every day. Yeah. 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 And, and, and that, that was almost my next question. So like, apart from cricket, because that's the side we know, like growing up, like what kind of topics were you writing? Like you mentioned, I think it's politics and some sort of Australian football, which I'm not aware of, but yeah. So the, what were the uh, things that yeah kept you going for writing? Yeah. We, we, or we have a version of football stuff. called, yeah, we, we have a version of football called Australian rules football. Uh, which is a stunningly mad, violent sport. Um, uh, yes, and I wrote about, I, I probably wrote more about that when I was growing up than I ever did cricket, weirdly, although I, I always liked cricket a little bit more um, than that. Um, yeah, I, I had a politics uh, blog very briefly. I wrote a lot of personal stuff. I, um, um, I wrote a lot of fiction, so screenplays and novels and things like that. Um, that I think fiction was, it's weird that I've become a nonfiction writer as I've become older, but as a as a uh, writer certainly for the first 25 years uh, uh fiction was my biggest thing so i don't know how many screenplays i have finished but i've certainly written quite a few of them and i have five novels um that i've probably written over my life two of which that are you know currently in a position that could be published but i haven't even done anything with them um and uh yeah from a from a very basic point of view uh it was that was it, that was my main thing was fiction i honestly always thought that i would either write screenplays write a sitcom or um 
uh, maybe do some some kind of novels was probably the, the kind of writing that I thought. So, um, you know, I've had a sitcom I've been working on for uh, quite a long time and occasionally, you know, it almost gets, it almost gets made, maybe it almost gets made is pushing it a little bit, but I get a bunch of meetings and then it disappears again. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, it was mostly, yeah, just fiction. I, look, fiction was always my main thing. Um, it really, I don't think, even when I wrote the politics blog, it was semi-fiction, semi-real, um, some of the footy stuff. Uh, and so the first real, the first real non-fiction stuff that I ever focused on hundred percent was, um, uh, the cricket writing. Right, right, right. Interesting. And, and so you could go and test five or six years of struggle, a lot of personal and financial struggles. So what was your first break then in cricket, like in the cricket writing? Was it Crick Info or your Cricket with Balls blog as well that you started, I think? Well, Cricket with Balls was the breakthrough because I didn't exist before then. Uh, I moved over to the UK and I wrote for uh, Wisdom Cricket um, um, magazine uh, I wrote for Spin Cricket uh, magazine I ended up becoming the editor of Spin Cricket I suppose uh, that is probably the main breakthrough I think I might have been writing for Cricket Info before Spin Cricket but Spin Cricket take picking an editor sort of out of nowhere uh, it was quite a, I think it was quite a big deal within Cricket so even the people who had kind of ignored me up until that point found it very hard to ignore me once I had been given an editor job even if they couldn't understand why I had been given that job no. uh, and then you know it, it, that that getting that job probably led to Crick Info bringing me on board so I think that before then, I'd certainly freelanced for, for Crick Info, but I think at a certain point that, and this is quite a regular one, I had a job interview recently, was told the same thing. Major organizations genuinely think that I am too maverick for them. Yeah. And I think that was a big thing with Crick Info at the start was like, they were terrified. And look, I know some people that I'm very close friends with now probably suggested that Crick Info shouldn't hire me at the time. Um, or even give me more work, not even hire me, because I never actually had a job with ESPN. I was always on contract. Uh, and uh, so so I wrote for the, the magazines, I never really wrote for any newspapers, wrote for a bunch of websites uh, around the world, random websites that don't even always, well, most of them don't even exist anymore. Uh, a lot of them popped up through the IPL, the early IPL years. Uh, wrote for a bunch of those things, made a bit of money off the blog, to be fair. And uh, I did actually, that was actually a good salary for a little while. And then was the editor of Spin for about six months, but it was the Spin was in huge financial problems. So I think we only finished three episodes, uh, three issues while I was there. And eventually I had to step aside because uh, it wasn't really working for me. Um, and then uh, that's when, when I left Spin as the editor, that is when I started making videos online again with um, uh, the first show was called two pricks at the ashes with Sam Collins. That then became, that then became two chucks with Crick info. And then within a year and a half, Crick info had given me, had given me a job after working with them. Uh, so there was a lot of, yeah, there was a lot of hard graft. There was a lot of weird writing assignments and picking up jobs sort of wherever I could. Um, and quite often long periods where there were, well, there was no work and all those sorts of things. But as a general rule, I was there and thereabouts, but I think in, I must have, I moved to UK in 2008 and in 2010, I was, that was about the point. So, you know, about the point where I said to my then wife that, I don't know if I'm going to be able to get a job in this. If you need me to go and get a normal job, um, that's, and you, cause you, you know, uh, by the, I think by 2010, I was really struggling. I think the, the money had dropped off on the blogs. So yeah. I wasn't getting much with that. So I was having to deal with freelance writing gigs and I wasn't quite in the system enough uh, at that point. And so I offered uh, to basically go get a real job. And she was like, look, I don't know how far away you are, but you've put all this time and effort into this and you've clearly built something that no one else has ever built before. Why don't you just keep going? And it was probably, it must've been early 2000. Yeah. And it must've been a few months later when spin offered me the editor's job. So she was right. Um, and then, um, 
and then it all sort of kept trickling in from there. I think from the moment I had this editor job, I was at least a competent freelance prospect. Uh, um, uh, you know, in work, I always had enough money coming in. Um, and then in 2012, Crick Info brought me on to a uh, proper contract, and I started uh, started working for them. Wow, wow, yeah, that that is an inspirational story of like your partner telling you that you know what, just keep trying. So, when that big break eventually happened, you getting a gig with Spin Cricket, and then also moving to Crick Info. Like it seems like, I mean, you're betting in a test match with a lot of body blows, edging through third man, just kept fighting it out. And then once that eventually happened, did you feel like you know what, I'll just take my helmet, run around, swerve my bat around? Did you feel inside like elated or like I mean happy about that this breakthrough? How did you feel about it? Do you feel like it was a struggle all those years behind? Yeah, I mean, I th- I think when when I got the spin job, you like, oh, you're the editor of a cricket magazine, but then you straight away find out that the cricket magazine doesn't have any money. And, you know, it was George DeBell um, who basically, you know, pushed for me to have that job and then helped push for me to go to Crick Info as well. And he... And when the magazine sort of didn't go anywhere and I had to leave because they weren't publishing. So I, I had to sort of go somewhere else. Um, it, I remember sort of thinking there's, you never quite feel in. So when you're talking about the body blows, it's more like playing in innings where you never quite feel in. When I got the Crick Info deal in 2012, I was just happy. You know, I, it was just good to be able to say to my parents, there's a job now. Yeah, it's not that I felt like I, I just didn't have to really worry about anything anymore. I don't know if there was elation, but I went to the 2012 World Cup uh, or T20, whatever we called it back then. Yeah. Um, uh, and Lanka, um, right? yeah, the one in Sri Lanka. And I said to my wife, my wife was pregnant at the time, you know, and I was 32. Uh, and I said to her, look, I don't know how this is going to happen, but by the end of this World Cup, I'm going to have a job. And I, and, and that's, I suppose, one thing that I've been very good at is just being like, I'm going to create so much work of such a high quality that everyone is going to be turning around the whole time going, what, how does he even do this? And that World Cup, I absolutely threw everything I had um, at it. And I, and Craig Info offered me a job at the end, but even other organizations for the first time were, were starting to sniff around at that point. And I think that, for me, it just it, uh, uh, it just felt like now I could concentrate on the work and not on all the nonsense. So, I, I, you know, I, it was probably a bigger thing for my parents. But, yeah, I think <laughs> I don't I don't know looking back how much there was a big moment of elation. It was probably more just a sigh of relief of just like, OK, that part is gone. And. And it never finishes because COVID came and I was more unemployed than I'd been ever in my life, you know, during, uh, during COVID. So you, you go back and you have all those sort of, sort of same problems again, but essentially, yeah, you have, um, uh, for me, it was just like, okay, that the last six years, I probably wasn't even more, it, see, I wouldn't have even ever thought about it as six years. I probably would have gone, it took me 32 years to get to a position where I have a job doing the thing I'm good at that I like. Um, and I was just like, excellent. Now I can just go and do the thing I'm good at. And for the next three years, that's what I did. Like, I didn't have to worry about all the other nonsense, which you have to worry about, um, all the time. So probably up until the age of 32, everything was a scrabble, yeah. you know, like a sc- scrabble, not a scrabble, a scramble. Um, and for the, the three years between oh, uh, 2013, 2014, 2015, that was the years where I just went great now. I've got the job. What am I going to do with it? And like, so for three years, I, I kept that same energy up and did as much as I could really. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's interesting. And, and, and so coming on to Crick Info then, um, so, and actually just before that, like, so what prompted the move to, to the UK or London? Like I'm assuming like, I mean, okay, let me first, like, I mean, make my uh, assumptions of why could it, it could have happened. It was it maybe it was your partner and also the kind of like the vibe I've picked from your conversation is like, maybe you weren't getting enough like writing or cricket opportunity in Australia. They, they weren't as welcoming for the kind of work you wanted to do. I wasn't um, getting any work in Australia. Right. Right. So right. what? 
this actually, it's ended up working out massively in my favor that I had never worked as a journalist in Australia, which meant I qualified for a tourist visa. Um, <laughs> a tu a tu a so there was a visa you could get, I think Australians, New Zealanders got it. I'm not sure how many other Commonwealth com countries had it open to them, but you could get a two year working holiday visa. As long as you were coming to the UK to work in a job you had never worked in before. Now that visa doesn't work for most people, but it worked perfectly for me because I'm literally, I was offered my first writing thing, a uh, job in the UK just before I, I got on the plane and I didn't, you know, actually do it until I got to the UK in case there's any visa or immigration people listening now, um, which meant that I had a two year period where I could live in the UK legally and work in this job. Um, and that was just a massive uh, piece of luck. I don't even know if that visa exists anymore. It was basically in the old days, people used to use it to be bartenders. So yeah. all the Australian, Australian um, you know, if you go to a bar in, in London now, half the managers are Australian or Kiwi. Um, and that's because of this old visa. Um, uh, as I said, I don't, don't even know if it exists anymore. And I, I don't even think it was available to all Commonwealth countries. I, I'd be shocked if they were allowing it to, you know, Bangladeshi, um, uh, you know, uh, immigrants and uh, Zimbabwean immigrants. But for whatever reason, it was available to Australian and, Engl uh, Australian and New Zealanders. So uh, that might have been uh, blatant racism or not. Or maybe I just don't know enough about the law. Um, but uh, essentially, so I can't, I, there was no work at all. So I came over um, and met my wife and uh we had already known each other before but uh no it was all about, if i'd been getting work in australia i don't think i would have moved to the uk uh because it was such a risk uh i was yeah. i mean i was literally coming over to work in a career that i had not worked in before um and uh you know so it was and, and you know the way the way that it was always going to work it was always going to be absolutely um a lot of luck there but there wasn't at that point, I was good at this thing. And people in the UK were saying to me, you can do this as a career over here. And no one in Australia was saying anything. And our film production company was fine, but it wasn't exactly exploding at that point. So you, you're sort of looking at it from two vantage points of like, what is the point of, what is the point of, um, of sitting there and uh, and wondering what could be the whole idea of what I was doing at that stage was to, you know, to follow these things. That was what I was trying to do, follow the things I was good at and follow the things I cared about. And I was being offered jobs in the UK. So I came to the UK. Right. Right. Interesting. So, and, and, and talking about Crick Info specifically, I think you uh, mentioned earlier, like today as well is that you kind of like grew up admiring a bit of Crick Info and, and, and me as well. Like, I mean, in my teenage years, like the, even still, like, I mean, there's so much happening in cricket now, so many websites and channels now, but like Crick Info really stands out the work they keep doing and like got a lot of innovative stuff for, for the cricket nerds. They've got all the stats and they do a lot of remarkable work. I don't need to repeat all of that, but uh, how was the experience of working at Cricket Info? Did you feel like you're working at, at an organization that, you know what, this is an amazing place? Like, not to work at, but like the work they were putting out there for people. Did you feel that? Yeah, it's it's not as big as you probably think it is. I think that's the first thing you learn about Cricket Info early on, especially, you know, being in the UK. Uh, I think they had maybe four regular staff when I, when I kind oh, of wow. started. No um, idea about that. Uh, so Andrew Miller was the editor, Andrew, uh, McGlashan was there. They had Liam and Sahil, I think might've been on the desk when I started. Um, and so, and it was also becoming very ESPN at the time that I, I started, whereas before that it had been very quick info. Um, so there was that smallness, but then over the years, uh, and we, I, I mean, we were, I, I was probably, I don't know what you would call it you'd probably say we were the sort of the second wave riders. So the first wave riders have been through being Rahul Bhattacharya and uh, Usman Samia Din um, and, and uh, those sorts of incredible people that had come through, um, gone on to bigger things. Um, and then, and then the next uh, generation that sort of came through was sort of, I suppose me and George. Um, and then on the back of that for Dos, Fernando, Isam, Actually, I think me and Fedos might have started at the same time. Uh, but I think Yassam started just after. So, you know, uh, 
we so, sort of had that. And I, I suppose that you, you can work with Crick Info for a long time and you work in these very, very small groups. So it doesn't feel as massive to you as it does to a fan on the outside who sees this huge website. Um, yeah. And it's a massive website in every way, you know, numbers of users to numbers of pages to everything. So, uh, yeah, look, it was when you've worked at a place so long, even if you have a lot of fond memories, you also, it's your work and, you know, you still want to moan about your boss. Sorry, Sam, but, but, um, uh, you know, it was on a very basic level, I remember a, a friend of mine was going to leave at one stage and a lot of my friends have now left. Um, and we were talking about it and he was getting offered this other job with someone. And I said, the one thing you haven't factored into you leaving yet is that the minute you leave, you won't be writing about cricket anymore. Cricket is one of the few places you actually write about cricket. If you're writing for a newspaper, you're writing about cricket news. Mm. And you, there are certain things you just cannot do at a newspaper that you can do at Crick Info. Uh, even if a newspaper tells you you can do it, eventually they're going to be like, we don't need that story on the second 11 bowling coach. And, and I think that that also traps Crick Info writers. Although, to be fair, I think that certainly over the last couple of years, I think that that, that sort of wave of people that we're talking about, uh, you know, um, Dan Bredig is another one. I feel like I'm missing a bunch of people who are going to be really upset, but you know, Dan Bredig and um, Sid Monger and Sharda, uh, well, Sharda's actually a little bit before us. She's probably from the first wave, but I think there's, there's certainly a little bit of a, um, there's been a change, but for a long time, and like if you work for Crick Info, it was actually, you was thought of as such a cricket nerd that you couldn't write for anyone else. Um, which is just not true. Almost everyone at Crick Info would be brilliant somewhere else also. But there is that sort of thing. But as far as being able to go to a World Cup and have Andy Zaltzman on one side and Fidel on the other side and Sambit Bowl um, on the desk and David Hopps on the desk, like the talent that Crick Info has. Um, and everyone is kind of more or less just trying to cover the cricket. Uh, it's a magical, magical thing. The Crick Info that I left doesn't exist anymore. Like it's already changed. Um, and it will be, continue to be more and more ESPN um, and, and a different kind of um, company. But, you know, it, it it's incredible to think that for the longest time, we have one of the biggest sporting websites in the world. Um, and it was about cricket. And it was set up by a bunch of fans. You know, the Crick Info wasn't set up by ESPN. Uh, Crick Info wasn't set up by the ICC. It was set up by a bunch of fans who were desperate to know more about cricket. And so the more I learned about that, the more I really honoured, like really wanted to honour um, the people who came up with it originally. Um, guys like Simon King and, and Badri and Vishal and Travis and th those sorts of guys who, you know, uh, were on the front lines as amateurs making this website. Uh, it's incredible to be a part of it. And, you know, uh, my name will always be associated with uh, working with Crick Info. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and talking about Crick Info specifically, like before it became ESPN Crick Info, talk me through, like, how did it really work as a corporation or like as a job? Like, you know what, you're writing articles and stuff, but like who was like the eventual CEO of like driving, you know, this is how the organization should work and how, how were you generating so many different ideas in those like years? working at Crick Info? Uh, well, Sam Bowles, the editor, and I don't know what his title is now. I think it might be executive editor or something. Yeah. Um, or CEO, or I'm not even sure, but uh, he's always been in charge the whole time that I've been involved. Um, before him, it was very, very amateur. Um, Simon King ran it on his own, um, and then they had a board. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, you you generally, everyone's different. I was the, I was the, oh, God, I forget this every time now. Glo I was the, their global writer. So I generally, for the first part of my career, um, would deal directly with Sambit Bowl as yeah. my editor. But they, after a certain point, probably by 2013, when it was quite clear that, I mean, I was doing stuff that, that their writers had never done before. And I think they just went, there's a lot of fighting internally to stop me doing that. Everyone wanted me to be a normal Crick Info writer and I, I couldn't do it. I, I didn't even really understand how to do it. And so eventually they just sort of let me off the leash a little bit, um, but made it clear that there are times I would have to do a press conference at a Champions Trophy game, which is fine. Um, and, 
and I think from 2013 onwards, it was like very much, I got to the point where they kind of just let me do what I wanted. It's yeah. very, very rare that that didn't happen. Um, so I had probably more freedom than any ESPN writer, uh, sorry, any Crick Info writer before me. Um, but that brought strengths and weaknesses and everything there. But generating problem, uh, generating pieces is not a problem for me. I, it's very rare that an editor suggests a piece to me. Um, I have currently, I probably have a, uh, have a draft folder with, I don't know, between 80 and 120 unfinished pieces. So yeah. I don't necessarily, I don't need an editor in the way that some other people do. Um, uh, but you work with them on the ideas quite a lot. Um, there are times at Crick Info where literally, Honestly, I was just dropping entire pieces on them and they didn't even know they were coming. And there are other times where me and the editors would spend months talking about them and, you know, uh, bring the piece to light. Uh, where I, th I think one thing that Crick Info got better at the longer I was there was just being a little bit more organized. Um, yeah. When um, Usman came in as, uh, I, think, I don't know, is he editor of the site? I'm not even sure what his job title is. <laughs> but when Usman came back, um, there was... It may it made it for me it made it a lot easier and uh, because he's a you know Usman is a really interesting uh, person in my life because you know I started off as a reader of his writing you know he then went out he was one of the first you know really big successful Crick Info people to go off and do something else almost at a similar time that I took over you know sorry that I came into Crick Info so then we kind of got to know each other that through that way. And then because we both wrote about cricket politics, we got quite close because we had to chat a lot. Uh, and we also, you know, we both absolutely love Pakistani cricket. So that was always handy. Um, uh, and so, uh, you know, for him to come back and, you know, I completely trust him and his judgment and he knows my writing style and he knows what I'm good at. And, uh, you know, it was a very, very, uh, a, a very, very good period. And that was probably, you know, um, uh, and there's been some great editors come through Crick Info. I mean, David Hops was probably probably had as much to do with anything with the fact that I had that freedom where he just kept saying to Sam, but all the time, stop trying to tell Jared what to do. Just Jared will be Jared and we'll work out how to channel that in the direction we need to channel it in. Um, and, you know, but, but also like if, if you think about it from a very practical point of view, I wouldn't have been able to be the writer I was if it wasn't for the fact that we had a great writer in Bangladesh and we had a great writer in Sri Lanka and we had someone who knew a lot about New Zealand cricket and whatever, because the one thing that is, I think a lot of people, a lot of cricket writers now want to be the global writer for Crick Info or the global writer for a Crick Buzz or that sort of huge, big position. Yeah. They have no idea how hard it is to cover all, all cricket teams and try and be an expert on all of them it's yeah. way easier to be an expert on 25 players from your own country than it is to you know literally uh wait nicholas Purins, the vice captain of west indies how god okay got now i've got to file that somewhere in my head in case i ever yeah. need it again um yeah. and uh and so you know working at, well that was one thing i always thought i always thought that cricket Info was a much bigger group sort of thing uh, I, 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 much more of a collective. In fact, I still think to this day, Crick Info don't use its overall talent enough. Like if I'm writing a feature about something, we should have like a, a proper group where like five or six people who care about the thing I'm writing about all chip in to make the pieces better. Um, yeah. But having those people available to you, you know, being able to contact Sid Munger and, and be like, you know, uh, you know, I've seen this happen in this game. Can you think of any other times that you've seen it? And him give you a list of 25 times he's seen it uh, is, is incredible. And I think those, for me, that was kind of the, my favorite thing with Crick Info was um, that sort of group knowledge pool that you can't get anywhere else um, yeah. that, uh, you know, that, for especially for a very long time crick info only really hired cricket nerds uh that's not maybe quite the case anymore but for a very long time like it didn't matter if it was like you know the third video assistant they was still they still knew everything and so it was an incredible environment to be in from that sort of point yeah yeah and and then from what i picked from your conversation is that what made Crick Info successful was like the quality of human capital they had and also the diversity of people who are because like as a fan like I mean you're getting something that is super successful there must be reasons behind it and the, those could be the reasons behind the success of Crick Info and and there I start to see a pattern that like 
you uh, were, were working at Frick Info, and then you also went to the ABC to do some radio commentary and do a consultancy stand in 2014-15. You also went to Pune in India to transform a museum. Like, talk about those experiences. Is it that I'm sensing a pattern now that you want to do different things? You just want, don't want to start with one thing. Yeah, I just did consultancy for the the, the museum. So I don't. Uh, I was in Pune, but um, uh, yeah, I didn't. I uh, you know it wasn't a long gig or anything. I just wrote them a, a thing of which they completely ignored. Um, and uh, you know, I think the cricket magazine. Uh, sorry, the cricket museum uh, is in the same place um, in many ways. Uh, although I've been asked to be a consultant on many things, and generally, what I can tell with the consultant is that you get paid a lot of money to not be listened to. Um, uh, no, I think like, you know, kind of ABC, uh, you know, Jim Maxwell was, um, a really interesting, uh, sort of figure in my life at a certain point where he, I'd never really thought about commentating. I'd done a little bit for test match so far. Um, at that stage there were, it was just like Jim Maxwell and Harsha Bogle were the only two sort of non-cricket regular non-cricketers who were commentating. So I, I just figured it wasn't a job for me. And then Jim had said, I really think you should look into commentating. Uh, ABC gave me a couple of chances. Uh, that has now led to me working with TalkSport as well. Yeah. Uh, again, it's just like someone says, do you want to commentate a test match from the MCG? My, my thing is, yes, I do want to do that thing. Uh, you know, and then, then I put the work in to try and work out what the best way to commentate is and what, you know, my commentary style is very again a bit like my writing style it doesn't quite fit into the standard um uh, neil manthorpe uh, I, I did my first ever test match with neil manthorpe and after the test i went up to him and i said can you give me some tips because uh, that was my first time and very nicely he, he was a bit shocked that it was my first time commentating or commentating for real um after what i'd done with test match so far and then he was like i think you're I think your skill is you have the abilities of a ball by baller and the abilities of an analyst. So they're yeah. very, very different jobs. And so I've, I've really always sort of kept Manners' thoughts in my head of that's kind of, I think where I'm at my best, um, you know, as a, as a ball by baller, I have the ability to drop analysis in without it being too heavy. And so, so there's a, <laughs> is a really interesting thing that people don't talk about much but there's a lot of analysis commentators or color commentators whatever you want to call them who literally only speak when they're asked a question and they answer it and it makes the ball by ball job is really hard because they have to fill in all the blanks and yeah. i think that i'm very popular with ball by ballers because i'm, I'm not even art waiting to be asked a question i'm in <laughs> i've got yeah. 17 opinions so um you know and and uh i i think that 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 sort of old-fashioned role is uh it, i mean we, that was basically developed in the 1950s in the bbc and abc and it's a perfectly acceptable way of commentating cricket but i think cricket commentary has moved on a long way since then and that yeah. there should be, I think that the ball by baller should have complete control of the delivery as the delivery is being bowled and hit. But outside of that, it should be a discussion about cricket, not yeah. a question and answer about cricket. And, yeah. uh, you know, I felt very passionate about that. And that's why, uh, you know, TalkSport um, listened to me um, very much, um, uh, you know, when I did consultancy for them before I became a commentator with them. And they they have tried to do that as well, and we, you know, and... Um, for me, I, I really like it when someone like the ABC says, you know, what would you do with commentary? And it's just like, and then they're like, here's a bunch of money. You go work it out and then come back to us. I actually really like that because, you know, and I've been asked to do a few things. Like I've had team owners in franchises say to me, I want to buy a team in this league. What team should I buy? I love yeah. to be able to go off and just be like, awesome. All right. Well, this team will give them this, this team will give them that. This team is, this land is cheaper in this place. So if they want to build a really big academy, they can build like the world's biggest academy here. You know, uh, this one though, if they actually want people to come and watch their games, this is all that sort of, I love being able to find all those sorts of things out. And I suppose now that I'm probably in that part of my career where people allow me to do things like that. So that's certainly how, that's how the ABC thing sort of happened. Right, right.
and 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 speaking of like uh my cricket teams because like yeah this is the new landscape of cricket the d20 and franchises and talking about your experiences of going to the west indies and doing a stint with the st lucia stars being offered to be their analytics head of analytics in 2018 and then you moved on to be the head of gm uh, you were the general manager in 2019 talk about those experiences in like easy words what were you doing for those two years and how was that experience like working the cpl yeah it was only one year i was actually promoted mid season because our gm quit oh, that's quite nice <laughs> uh, uh uh, being an analyst is a sen- it's as simple as this. You are trying to find information that will make the bowler's job easy at the top of the mark. You are trying to find if there's anything that you can help the batter um, so that they can plan their innings a little bit better. And you're trying to help the coach select the best team and the captain make the best, most informed decisions. It's as simple as that, really. Uh, everything yeah. else, everything else on top of it, is quite complicated. General manager job is it's the most high pressure job I've ever had. Uh, it was the most fast moving job I've ever had. Uh, it's uh, incredible. But essentially in that position, you are hiring, firing everyone in the franchise. Uh, you are fighting with the CPL over uh, uh, new laws and new changes. I remember there was a particular change that we're going to bring into the CPL. And I was like, well, this will not help our team. Uh, we will not stand for this, this sort of stuff. Uh, so you have to understand contracts and all those sorts of things. You have to... Uh, you know, I was very heavily involved with uh, um, looking for sponsors and, but dealing with players, parents and all these sorts of, you know, uh, things that you don't even think about. Um, so yeah, general manager was, it, it allows you, if you do it in, in a very good environment, it allows you to pick the team and the, the coaching staff that you want and then set up a system for them to succeed in. Um, and then there is a lot of other moving parts that are absolutely crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and starting off as an analyst for, let's say, St. Lucia Stars. So what was your role like? For example, St. Lucia Stars are playing, uh, I, I don't know like the full names of all the teams, but like I do have an understanding of them. Okay, maybe the Tridents tomorrow. So will you just dig out all the name of the top batsmen and the top bowlers and like what should be the matchups? So like what's your research like and what's the output that you're providing and who do you provide the output to? Is it the captain or the coach or the individuals? Uh, so we would have a team bowling meeting, which I would run with the bowling coach and uh, I would go through all the batters one to 11 yeah, and we'd go through their strengths and weaknesses and where you can bowl to them. Uh, yeah. And then we would, uh, I would, uh, and then I would do special reports for the spinners separate to that. Cause there's stuff that they need to know that the, that the rest of the group don't need to know uh, with the batters. I would only give them information specifically when I thought it might help them. I think this guy might open uh, this guy's wrong and is faster, slower than normal. Uh, I would deal, I would work directly with the coach to be like, you know, the coaches, uh, uh, you know, when you're losing and you know, short franchise coaches want to make lots of changes. So most of my stuff was like, I don't think we need to make changes. I think yeah. this is our best team um uh and then uh and then working with the captain yeah just sending him matchup stuff of so making sure that he has everything about the batters written for him really and then he can make his own decisions decisions on on the back end of that um as much as possible uh depending on which captain you work with uh what sort of information they want some bat uh, some captains just want what their um the bowlers have so captains usually very heavily involved in the bowling meeting and uh and uh, I do a lot of my stuff via WhatsApp as well. So the, yeah. every group I set up, the captain will be in that group um, so right. that he knows what I am telling all the players. Um, and also, so he has all the information. So I don't even almost, at a certain point, unless the captain wanted something very specific every game, um, uh, and sometimes I would do that about the pitch, um, generally I would, you would almost inform them via via the other methods um and then but it depends every team's different one some teams i only presented to the coaches some teams i work directly with the players um it's it, it really depends and, and and you said uh sometimes you're doing a like separate session for spinners and uh being a part-time left round spinner as well with a very dodgy action um what what are the what is the kind of stuff that you are telling them because we know that spin bowling is a massive thing in D20 cricket and franchise cricket. 
what what is the kind of stuff is it like the boundary sizes or like the trajectories they need to bowl or ends need to bowl what kind of stuff are you telling them no i wouldn't tell them that because that's a captain's decision anyway um no i i would be telling i would be saying to them this player sweeps and this player doesn't sweep and this right. player reverses and this player doesn't reverse this player hits over cow corner and this player hits straight so i'd be hitting them i'm telling them hitting zones and then if we had enough information on the batter i might also i've got a bit of a theory that most players against spin only hit the ball when it is either on the stumps or off the stumps right so most players will have a strike rate of like a runner ball when you bowl on the stumps but they might okay. score nine runs and over when it's off the stumps or vice versa because okay. it's about where their hitting zones are right so i'll probably give them little things like that um as well and uh you know if we had a leg spinner in our team i might say to the leg spinner this guy hasn't picked wrong ones so that they've got that in the, in the front of their mind so those are the sorts of the basic things with, with spin there's not that much you can do different at a certain yeah. point so yeah. lo- i think lines is one thing you certainly can do differently which is why if i saw something specific but um that i thought might help a spinner i would definitely tell them but yeah just i think what spinners really need to know is i'm going to be bowling to this guy where does he hit my kind of bowling is the most important thing because you there's no point putting out there's no point putting out four guys on the leg side if he's going to reverse sweep yeah you know you're yeah setting the field incorrectly to begin with um and then he's got one or two boundaries to start with and you're you know you're already behind that the 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 um uh, the game a little bit there so those are the sorts of basic things right right and and, and talking about like the if if on top of your head like if you remember like uh the current pollard was the captain i think so in the year that you were there and then i don't think the team ended up doing so well because from why what, what, what i saw i think they just won three games out of 10 maybe ended up second last on the league table so i mean how how was the mood like in the camp and did you feel maybe jared somewhere down there has got to blame as well for the team not doing well or something like that or how was it like this season no that, that that whole season was a complete shit show um to be fair when you say we won three games i think we won three and three and we had a washout um and we hadn't they hadn't won a game for the previous two seasons i don't think oh, wow. so that was actually quite a big improvement over everything else no it was a shit show as i said the gm quit there was the uniforms didn't fit we barely got to games on time it was absolutely a debacle from beginning to end um so us getting three wins was a was was huge realistically um but yeah it was a very unprofessional environment um and i learned a lot on what not to do based on uh that particular job right right and 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 got to like you moved to melbourne stars in the big bash league 2018 19 how how was that experience like and i think glen maxwell was a captain down there Glenn Maxwell was captain. That was I worked directly with the coaching staff there. Um, so Maxwell read my reports and everything, but they weren't. Um, uh, I mean, him didn't really interact that much. I spent most of my time chatting to the coaches. Yeah, just very different. Um, Melbourne Star is a bit more professional, although not as professional as I think it should be, but but a lot more professionally run. Um, and uh, and yeah, we. Uh, they uh, they finished last the year before I started and then we made the final and we should have won the final really um and, and collapsed a little bit at the end of that of that final and lost the game so you know to be with that uh, to be with the team that had been on the bottom of the table uh and had gone so well was certainly uh, a great thing but yeah it was a completely different environment from beginning to end and 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 just a question on the coach um i think stephen fleming was down there right and he's a big name in franchise cricket what he's done for the chennai super kings people really admire him do, do like what do you think like is that that he brings like quite diff- is this quite different on the table uh i think he's very good at just dealing with he he knew what he wanted from me specifically and he knew what i could do and he put me in the direction of those two things Now yeah. if he did that with me as an analyst I've heard stories of him doing that with players literally how do I make your your training session work for you better you know how do I how do we make you be a better player in the game and I know that sounds simple but that's not how all coaches look at coaching and there's many different kinds of coaches so I think Fleming's sort of main strength is um the ability to say okay Jared has turned up and Jared can do this so let's let Jared do that we don't need him to do everything else we don't need him to be involved we're happy with everything else so yeah. jared will do that and and i think 
I get got the feeling that that was how he, well, I mean, I've heard him talk about it and I've heard players that um, are with him talk about it before. He's v very good at sort of setting up everyone else to be uh, the, uh, in, the, in the right environment for them to succeed. As, uh, about like the, the matchups, like I've, I've seen like people have been quite big in like, I mean, the franchise cricket and stuff about the word matchups. Like, is there any statistical evidence you have gone as far as suggesting that, you know, what a best man should deny singles if it's got a good matchup going on? How, how does it add, add, add that much value in D20 cricket? Well, if, you, if you've if you got a batter who has a strike rate of 95 against off spin at one end and you have a guy at the other end who has a strike rate of 170 against off spin and you can get the guy with 170 to face six balls of it, that's yeah. almost double, right? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. those situations don't happen as often as you would think, but they do happen. Um, yeah. So I see matchups are, they're such a fascinating thing because I think cricket got absolutely obsessed with matchups because baseball, that was where data had the first big impact in baseball or one of the first places. But our matchups aren't like baseball matchups. You know, yeah. you bowl one over and then you might not bowl for the next four overs, right? So yeah. you've sent a guy in because he's going to smash left arm finger spin and the, oppos and our team and, you know, the opposition stopped bowling left arm finger spin. Uh, so I think that they are, we're right to know about them and we're right to plan for them and we're right to think about them, but I'm not quite sure they work in the way that cricket teams think that they should work at the moment. But from yeah. a from a perspective of if I have, if if, if I lost a wicket on the first ball of the over, and I have a tail ender who can smash spin. I give him yeah. five balls to face that. And I think, you know, Melbourne Stars um, did that uh, a bit. And I've seen other teams do stuff like that. Those sorts of matchups I really like. Outside of that, you have to factor in that your batter might be at the wrong end, which is when, you, when we start talking yeah. about the stuff that you're talking about, which is why I'm just like... <laughs> I yeah. remember having a chat with a player who was brewing against off spin and saying, I had to watch you. Uh, you face two balls and over because you miss hit two of the, the balls to long on. What, what does that single get us? If yeah. you just sat, sat there and kept swinging, you would have at least hit a boundary. And the guy that replaced you uh, couldn't, was never going to hit a boundary. There's no, there's no amount of balls he was going to face. He was ever going to hit a boundary. Um, and so I, I think that's where... Um, I think that's where teams might get a little bit smarter when it comes to matchups, hopefully. Yeah, but I just wanted to hear a bit about your thoughts on Pakistan cricket. It was actually quite hilarious reading that article after the 2019 World Cup. You were saying that you can try, but you never, you can never out Pakistan. Pakistan, And then also Pakistan is a real winner of all the World Cups. Uh, what are your memories of like Pakistan cricket and what, what really makes you love the game that you say mentioned that is pretty evident in your writing? Uh, well, apparently recently I hate forward Ahmed is the last, uh, Pakistani fan theory, which is absolutely wrong and bonkers. But anyway, um, I, uh, I, I, Mushtaq Ahmed, I suppose is the, the most simple thing, but I think Mushtaq Ahmed and then was a Makram and Inzamam al Haq all sort of came, you know, uh, into my life at a similar time, um, playing in Australia at a similar time. And, uh, they didn't play cricket like Australian cricketers play cricket. And it probably opened up my Pakistan cricket probably opened up my eyes to the fact that cricket could be so different from so many different places. And uh, the, if you look at the difference between Mushtaq Ahmed and Shane Warne, Shane Warne's an efficient killing machine and Mushtaq Ahmed is like a magic pixie. Uh, you know, uh, was a macram, wasn't like anyone else in Zamam al Haq no one like him was going to come through the system for Australia. So I think that Pakistan really opened up my eyes to cricket and probably is the reason that I ended up becoming a global cricket writer rather than an Australian cricket writer it all comes back to Pakistan. So uh, I just love watching them and I've always loved watching them. Uh, I also love, you know, they have the most interesting fan base, I think, in cricket. I think that's, yeah. you know... Uh, I always say that everyone thinks India has the most full-on fan base, but that's only because there's more Indians than any other country. But I think Pakistan has the most ridiculous fan base. Um, yeah. And so, you know, you, and, and when you like the team, you kind of become a de facto part of that. And I think the, the piece you're talking about in 2019, which I don't really remember. Um, I remember writing it in a weird hotel out of Nottingham, outside of Lancashire, maybe. Can't remember where I was. Yeah. But 
Um, I just remember thinking that they'd been that if you're a Pakistani fan, you've been on such a Pakistani journey in that World Cup. Yeah, and that that seems to happen more. Pakistan seemed to have those kinds of journeys more than anyone else. I mean, the Champions League, uh, Champions Trophy is still one of the most odd things ever. I've never seen a team as bad as they were in that game against India go on to yeah. win a tournament in anything. Um, and so, yeah, I think, you know, I've been following them since I was a kid. Um, I, you know, they're, I've, I've always loved Pakistani cricket, the way they've gone about it. And then probably the first fan base that kind of really got behind my writing was Pakistani fans as well partly because I like them and I write about them a lot. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, I think that they were really a gateway for me understanding a lot more about cricket and loving a lot more about cricket. And I, if you look at the last 10 years, they've just, you know, and that's the period I've written about, like put, put it this way, Sri Lankan cricket's great. And I like, and there's a lot of madness and craziness in Sri Lankan cricket. But the yeah. last 10 or 15 years um, of what has happened to Pakistan is like nothing like what has ever happened to any other country, really. And that happens to be the same period of which I've been a professional cricket writer. So it kind of makes sense that I would have written so many big pieces on Pakistan because they've been, um, you know, a, such a strong team when it comes to the narrative. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and and I'll just try to repeat the line from from the review of that article. You said, as a young guy, I fell in love with Pakistan cricket, but as an old man, I'm falling, falling in love with the Pakistan fans. And uh, so, so yeah, that's, that's quite, uh, that was quite hilarious, actually. But it, it was an absolute pleasure, Jared, to speak to you about. And interestingly, the chat turned a lot more to be non-cricket than I actually thought. But hopefully, if I can someday, if you will be willing to just talk to this guy about cricket again we we can probably meet again and it's an absolute pleasure no problems thanks for having me on right have a good day yeah.